Well, welcome. Good evening to Oise, Rotman, and all our fans and family joining us tonight. Welcome to our Alumni Family Fun Week event featuring uh, Oise alum and our distinguished guest tonight, Dr. Dylan Brown. And he'll be speaking to us about the importance of family conversations, talking to children about current global events. Just before we get started, we wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Mendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Tonight's event, as well as our virtual scavenger hunt, is a result of a partnership between uh, University of Toronto's Ontario Institute for Studies in Education and the Rotman School of Management. Uh, it gives me a distinct pleasure to thank our colleagues and fellow organizers from Rotman. It's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you for your stellar efforts in creating a fun and meaningful experience for our registrants, including business and community professionals, researchers, leaders, innovators, and educators, some of whom are parents and guardians. I now have the pleasure of introducing our alumni speaker, Dr. Dylan Brown. Dr. Brown is the University of Toronto and Oise alum who received his MSc and PhD in clinical psychology. He is assistant professor of psychology and the principal investigator of the whole family lab at the University of Waterloo. His program of research examines the influence of adverse childhood experiences, trauma, and socioeconomic status on human development. He applies a unique fam family systems lens to understanding various child developmental phenomenon, including academic achievement, behavior, and mental health. Thank you again, Dr. Brown, for joining us today. Later, you will hear from OEZ's alumni leader, Asa Sani, who will facilitate the Q&A for this evening. Asta graduated from OISE with her Master of Education in Developmental Psychology and Special Education. She continues to work in the health sector and currently leads a small team in the virtual health space to help people navigate the healthcare system. Asta is passionate about sustainability, equity, and access, and is hopeful about how children today see, understand, and navigate these issues. Uh, please note this session will be recorded and available at a later date. There will be opportunity to put your questions in the Q&A function. I will now pass the torch to Dr. Brown. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Sim. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, I wish we were in person. That would be uh, a wonderful thing, uh, though this is the next best thing. Now, right now, I'm seeing myself. So let's try to share our screen again. Are you seeing slides? Can someone give me confirmation? Yes, yep. Great, great. Uh, well, yes, once again, thank you for organizing this and thank you for the invitation. It, it, it really is an honor. Uh, so this evening, I'm gonna be having a conversation or hopefully facilitating a conversation with all of you about conversations. So we're kind of inherently a bit meta in what we're gonna be talking about today. I think uh, everyone should be commended for attending a topic and a conversation such as this uh, in the evening after work when folks are very busy and very stressed already. And uh, I, I hope what we review and go over today is of use to uh, those of you who are, who are listening and who are watching. Um, I'm hoping that this can be as informal as possible. I'm only gonna be talking um, for a little bit and then we'll have a Q&A period. And as you can see from the title of my slide here, uh, we're gonna be talking about family conversations and, and really the importance of talking to children about current global events. And I'll just tell you, this is coming from not only my uh, perspective as a uh, researcher and a, and a uh, scientist of, of family life, but also as a therapist. So I'm a, a practicing clinical psychologist and I specialize in family therapy, and I've been conducting therapy now for, I guess, going into the, the third year um, of the pandemic and doing so mostly virtually. Uh, so it's been a very interesting uh, two years for myself, um, and I feel you know, quite honored to have the opportunity to 
bear witness to the stories and the conversations that have been coming from the many families I'm so fortunate enough to work with. So I always like to start with Mr. Rogers because he's one of my favorites. And for those of you who've seen those recent documentaries around Mr. Rogers, you can see that every so often they would bring Mr. Rogers out of retirement to uh, talk about something upsetting that happened in the news. So for example, when 9-11 happened, um, they brought Mr. Rogers back uh, to the television set to talk to children about things that were going on and his history of communicating upsetting and frightening and scary news to young people uh, goes all the way back to the Vietnam War when he was just kind of getting started out. And uh, he uses wisdom from his mother as I often do myself as well. And, and he tells us that when he was a boy and he would see scary things in the news, his mother would say, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. And more recently, I've been asked to do several media appearances and, and talks such as this in light of what's been going on in, in the Ukraine um, and communicating that news to children. And uh, like any disaster, we see many, many helpers coming out, um, many helpers that are coming out to uh, specifically help with the refugee uh, crisis and the humanitarian crisis that's coming from that country right now. And I also feel very lucky in that I'm able to see the helpers in my immediate work too. And that is I see the remarkable strength and resilience of, you know, quote unquote, regular families on a daily basis, supporting their children with mental health difficulties, um, facing you know, problems and challenges uh, associated with the pandemic right now. So there are, there are helpers everywhere. And I think Mr. Rogers, um, as he usually is, is quite astute in, in identifying uh, this kind of cognitive reframe we can take when faced with upsetting events. Now, I mentioned Mr. Rogers has been at this for a while. I just wanted to preface our conversation today with this idea that we're not new, uh, to quote Leonard Cohen, one of my uh, favorite artists, we're not new in that the challenges and issues we face today, while they might be new in of themselves, we are not new in that we've been communicating to children uh, long before I was alive about uh, distressing and upsetting topics. And this is just uh, a list going back 70 years or so around various events, some to be celebrated, some frightening and some uh, quite traumatic. Uh, that when exposed to children can create a sense of confusion or unease um, or perhaps even uh, be threatening in regard to their, their safety. And so with that, I think we're jumping into what is a long-standing conversation, one that has been going on um, for some time in its newest permutation vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the pandemic and, and now the war in the Ukraine and, and who knows, maybe even a sixth wave coming down uh, the pipe. I promise that this uh, talk is not going to be depressing. In fact, uh, my intention is it's quite the opposite uh, because it's my uh, professional opinion and I think there's plenty of research to support it that the conversations that you're having as a family right now um, are really doing doing the trick, you know, uh, these types of conversations do not have to be um, eloquent or they, they don't have to be scripted in any type of way, um, really kind of clunking through it the way that we do when approaching challenging, uncomfortable topics um, really is all that you need to do in order to uh, convey to children uh, what they need to hear in light of threatening and, and challenging information. And I'll provide a few tips that I have along the way here. So let's do a bit of an overview for what the next 25 minutes or so will look like. Uh, first, I'd like to just touch base on where we are at with child youth and family mental health uh, as a society right now. And then from there, I'd like to talk about why we often avoid difficult conversations and what the consequence of avoiding difficult conversations can be. Uh, then I'll move on to 
a few tips that I have uh, that I've developed um, throughout the years as a family therapist around how to approach challenging topics. Um, as a family therapist, I feel like my specialty is talking about uncomfortable things. Um, and and that's, that's really one of the biggest jobs of, of a family therapist. And then lastly, uh, number five there will be unstructured and then we'll have Q&A. And I'd like to hear from, from all of you around particular areas uh, that you're finding challenging right now or also uh, where you're having success with your family. Okay, before presenting data, I'd like to just begin with a bit of an anecdote. And this is a, uh, a made up family that is a compilation of families uh, that I've been seeing in, in therapy here. And we have uh, the Ramirez family and they're a blended family with both Victor and Helena having children from previous marriages. In the pandemic, Victor was laid off, now having kind of precarious employment. Helena is an essential worker and she's been doing overtime to kind of make ends meet. Uh, unfortunately, their dreams of home ownership uh, were squashed with the, the housing crisis that we're in right now and those dramatic increases in, in housing prices that we've seen over the last few years, especially in Ontario. Um, Mary, the younger child, uh, was really struggling with masks. And in the most recent back to school transition, um, started having some school refusal and at one point became so dysregulated um, she needed to present at the emergency room. The parents needed to bring her into the hospital because they were um, alarmed with, with um, her, her level of dysregulation. Um, Victor's feeling some resentment of the childcare responsibilities that are falling on him right now and Helena's feeling report uh, of exhaustion and, and burnout. And so with regard to this question of the Ukraine and Russia, while they're not directly impacted, um, Louisa, who is a 12 year old, has been on TikTok and has been watching some of the videos um, that, have, that are you know, coming directly from the ground in the Ukraine and has been having some nightmares. So that's a lot, right? That's a lot of stuff. And it is by no means uh, unusual with what I see regularly as a family therapist. And so what we can describe this as is, is cumulative stress. I think for a lot of history, we're, while we have had these events, many of these stressors have been uh, incidental or relatively time limited in nature. Um, however, thanks to the pandemic and this kind of uh, chronicity of hardship that we find ourselves in, there's cumulative stress. And that's really starting to wear on a lot of families. A lot of folks are doing well, uh, though it is really wearing on a lot of families out there right now. And so how does this kind of get into the family? How does stress get inside families? Well, this is a, a theoretical model that uh, my colleagues and I published at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and I'll just kind of use my cursor here to highlight where I'm talking about. All families kind of started the pandemic with pre-existing levels of vulnerability. Um, maybe that's socioeconomic disadvantage. Maybe there's some health conditions in the family. Maybe there's a history of adversity. And then along comes the pandemic. I've added dot, 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 because we're kind of layering on additional stressors and, and upsetting things that are happening that we're privy to in the news. Um, there's kind of social disruption taking place and this can undermine caregivers' well-being. And uh, when I'm saying caregiver, I'm referring to not only parents, but other caregivers in the family, such as grandparents, aunts, uncles, older siblings. Um, that can inform how families are doing and that ultimately can influence children's mental health. However, there is good news. That is, families are a source of resilience. So despite all of this challenge we've been experiencing collectively as a society, families, the most kind of proximal bubble uh, around which uh, children are surrounded, uh, families can buffer or mitigate the detrimental effects of this larger scale social disruption. And when you look at the most recent data, I'll present some of that right now, we are seeing increases in mental health problems in parents and in children. However, it's not as catastrophic 
as many people initially hypothesized in light of all this COVID-19 mental health research that we've been doing. So let's take a little look here. These are our newest parents, that is postpartum uh, people. And on the y-axis, we have the rate of mental health visits for people who are in their postpartum period. And on the y-axis, we have time before the pandemic and after the pandemic separated by that green line. Based on the normal trends before the pandemic, we can project what we would expect to happen in the future. And what we're seeing is the request for uh, physician and psych uh, uh, psychiatric visits for people in the postpartum period have uh, significantly increased. What are parents worried about right now? Well, parents are struggling with their own mental health difficulties. This is the Ontario Parent Survey. So this is Ontario specific data, a pretty large sample of around 7,000 um, 7, parents and caregivers. Almost 60% were um, reporting symptoms that would meet the clinical criteria for depression, which is, which is higher, which is much higher than, than what was pre-pandemic. And parents are reporting that they're worried about remote learning, screen time, managing their children's own anxiety and stress, children's behavior, and just kind of household organization and that kind of thing. Now, what about kids? We can employ the same methodology and look at pre-pandemic visits. We do see this seasonality because mental health visits in the summer and during the winter holiday tend to dip. And so based on that trend, we project into the future what we would expect to see. And at the beginning of the pandemic, the solid line, uh, children were not getting the same uh, level of mental health care that we would uh, typically expect. But since that time, since the initial lockdown period, things have been about 10 to 15 percent higher. So there are more children reaching out for um, more children and their families reaching out for mental health care than previous. And that's on top to all this new virtual therapy that I was talking about earlier. We didn't really have much of that before, but now uh, telehealth is certainly here to stay. Our best estimate of global prevalence of mental health problems in children right now is between one in four and one in five. And that's for the common mental health problems of depression and anxiety. Back to the Ontario Parent Survey, 40% of parents are suggesting that their children's mood had deteriorated. Um, one in five are reporting getting into long arguments about misbehavior. 40% are finding that they're kind of uh, getting a little picky on, on, on children when uh, they're stressed or upset, which is, you know, we're all human, right? So that's something that happens. Uh, this, this is kind of an example here of why I'm interested in family therapy, because all these stressors have ripple effects across the family. Uh, that is, half of people are reporting a high level of conflict uh, with, their, with their spouse, one quarter reporting that they're exploding, and uh, my group recently published a systematic review showing that um, there were increases in intimate partner violence um, associated with the pandemic as well. So, you know, that's, that's some heavy stuff. So let's just take a moment there and, and, and reflect on the challenging two years uh, that we have had, you know, acknowledging our successes while also uh, kind of understanding how, how hard it really has been for, for quite some time. Um, I think most of us, I don't want to speak on behalf of anyone, um, certainly myself and a lot of folks I know are really feeling uh, the burnout and the crunch um, as we're kind of just kind of crawling out of winter again and dusting off that seasonal affective disorder. So why do we avoid difficult conversations? It probably isn't surprising given the data that I just presented to you, right? Um, but before we proceed, we need an operational definition of what avoidance is. Um, avoid, avoidance, you know, that's uh, a term that we use regularly in our language. Let's, you know, specify it a little bit more. I define avoidance as the act of engaging in alternative behaviors, actions, thoughts, or responses in order to circumvent an aversive or an undesirable situation, either consciously or unconsciously. 
So stated differently, we avoid things when they suck. You know, that's kind of human, right? And so what's the opposite of avoiding? It's like facing, confronting, uh, meeting, allowing, validating. Pay attention to that word because I'm going to be talking about that um, more and more, this idea of validating. Now, in my talk here, I'm not suggesting that we stop avoiding, whether they're conversations or stop avoiding um, difficult situations at all, because avoidance is a form of coping and a certain level of avoidance is normal and healthy. Avoidance becomes problematic when it becomes too pervasive and becomes the dominant strategy that we rely on. So then here we are thinking about what's going on overseas, the Ukraine and the refugee crisis. Um, and we're all struggling here with the pandemic, trying to support our mental health um, so that our families are okay. And these difficult conversations seem, or they might seem for some of you very far away. So why are we gonna bother with that? And you know, more and more as I do this work, I, I sometimes feel like the conditions, uh, the economic and the socioeconomic and, and, and occupational conditions of North America right now are not conducive to, to healthy family life where we're depending on two incomes and uh, the cost of living is going up. Um, so while we're struggling with the immediate, why would we bother having these difficult conversations, especially those that seem far away? I have one more slide to kind of depict this. I often hear from parents who say that it feels like in their home, they're walking on eggshells. And maybe you can reflect right now and think about if it's ever felt like at home, you're walking on eggshells. Or maybe you have a child at home who's struggling with a mental health condition. And you do want to bring up some of the difficult topics, but you just don't want to crack those eggshells because you're just trying to keep it together. And one thing that I hope that you get from this talk is that using these difficult conversations as a medium into which you can promote closeness and promote cohesion and harmony in your family and even begin to support your loved ones or yourself with mental health problems. Um, you know, this is really a channel that we can be, um, be what am I trying to say here, kind of uh, relying on and, and exploiting uh, to, to better our situation rather than avoiding it because we feel we don't have time or we feel like it's not worth it. Now, what happens when we avoid situations as individuals? This is kind of cognitive behavior therapy 101 for anxiety. So say we're feeling anxious. When we're feeling anxious, you know, we have that fight or flight response. We're scanning for danger, whether it's like physical danger and our social surround, or maybe it's interpersonal or relational danger if we're anxious in social situations. Um, our focus narrows and it kind of comes on to ourself and we begin to try and escape um, or avoid that situation. And in the short term, we feel relief. In the long term, that causes our anxiety to generalize and get worse. And more and more things tend to cause us anxiety and we tend to avoid more and more. And that's ultimately how people develop agoraphobia where they can't leave the house because it started with avoiding something. This is another way of looking at the exact same thing. And that is if we kind of avoid, you know, our anxiety is climbing and we try to escape and avoid, we fail to uh, what we say habituate to the scary uh, situation or the difficult conversation. And we never quite get there. We don't master our anxiety. Avoidance can look a little bit different in families. And for this, I like to use animal metaphors. Um, so when we think about avoidance, or the avoidance of unpleasant emotion or the avoidance of difficult topics, we generally think of the ostrich, head in the sand and just, it's not there, ears are plugged, I'm not gonna really worry about that right now. Though avoidance can take on another approach too. We might look at the jellyfish and the jellyfish, as we all know, stings. And so I'd like everyone to ask themselves, when you're approaching an emotional situation, do you tend towards the ostrich or do you tend towards the jellyfish? Do you tend to react and get kind of stingy when things are getting tough? Or do you kind of shut down and try to um, act more like the ostrich? And most of us usually tend towards 
one of these in, um, in, in a dominant kind of fashion. If you don't know which one you are, you're an ostrich. <laughs> okay, same with caregiving, right? Um, we can lean towards a different kind of pole or polarity in our caregiving style. Some, some of us tend to protect and want to um, maybe uh, coddle or, or, or uh, you know, help our loved ones not encounter frightening situations more like the kangaroo. And others might be more kind of rhinoceros oriented where we tend to um, be directive or, or rigid, or maybe we, we raise our voices and say, this is how it's gonna be. And the net result of these kind of animal metaphors that I'm using to describe emotion and caregiving styles is that extreme forms of family interactions can develop. So sometimes I work with families that are like kangaroo jellyfish, they're down here. They're very emotionally reactive and they're, they're very kind of enmeshed and kind of close and um, on top of each other. In other situations, I might work with a family that's more like uh, a rhinoceros ostrich combo where they don't really do emotions. Some families have implicit rule that we're not talking about emotions in our family. And maybe when things do come up, it's very firm and very kind of uh, my way or the highway kind of, kind of uh, way of doing things. And when we get into these extreme areas, we lose the opportunity for authentic connection with our loved ones. And by approaching these difficult conversations, I'm suggesting that we can get closer to this authentic connection that is good for all of us. It's one of the things that we need as humans to connect in a meaningful and lovingful way that is safe with our loved ones. So some benefits of having these diff difficult conversations, as I mentioned, it's an opportunity. So rather than things that we don't need to think about, it could actually be um, a more safe topic around which you can connect with your loved ones. Maybe something very personal, uh, such as the decisions somebody's making or not making around their school or their, their career or their, um, their uh, risk behaviors and thinking things like substance use and that kind of thing. Those can be difficult to bring up. But if we need to prime the pump a little bit, having difficult conversations around uh, global events or, or even more proximal events can be an opportunity to connect. Young people are aware of this. I have a caveat there with children zero to five. A lot of the recommendations out there are, are to kind of um, shield children from uh, excessive news consumption with uh, some of these scary things that are going on. But once children, and it's worse to not talk about the things. Uh, this can support emotional regulation and co-regulation. We can battle uh, misinformation and also it's an opportunity to show compassion and empathy for our global neighbors. So how the heck do we do this? Easier said than done, right? Well, I'm going back to our theoretical model here that is families serving as a source of resilience, buffering against the challenges and stressors of the day. And there are a few dimensions that we think about when we conceptualize families. That's how we communicate, how we organize ourselves and our time and the things that we believe in. So I'm gonna tap into each of those right now before we head over to Q&A. I was on an airplane last week for the first time in three years. I forgot how small airplanes are, wow. But of course there was the oxygen mass principle. And what do they say when you're traveling with a young person, put your oxygen mask on first. Healthy children need healthy parents. I realized I forgot a why in there. I uh, apologize for that. Uh, healthy children need healthy parents to thrive in the world, okay? And before we can do anything for our loved ones, we need to take care of ourselves. And over time, as we practice having these conversations, we see that the intensity of our discomfort begins to attenuate and kind of drop a little bit. This is the idea of habituation. And over time, we can become uh, masters of approaching uh, difficult topics with our family members. And I think that's what happens you know, for, for uh, the family therapist 
you know, you get so used to bringing up uncomfortable things over time, it just doesn't irk you as much. So right now, if it's difficult for you to bring up sensitive topics in your family, doing so on a regular basis should make it easier following the central principles of behaviorism and, and learning theory. And this is the idea of us sharing the collective burden together. There's a lot going on in the world and a lot of distress. And as Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers and we can help each other through this time. So back to our animal metaphors, what are we going for? Well, I had mentioned that the jellyfish and the ostrich are kind of extreme examples of dealing with emotion, whether maybe it's too much or, or um, suppressing and not demonstrating enough. And so we go for something in the middle, kind of like the St. Bernard dog. You know, there's, there's a, a comfort with the display of affect, um, yet it's not gratuitous, it's not reactive, it's kind of dependable and reliable. And then for our caregiving style, rather than being the rhinoceros or the kangaroo, we try to orient towards the dolphin. And I am I'm not a marine biologist, but I understand when baby dolphins are learning how to swim, the mother dolphin swims underneath. And that's a beautiful example of autonomy support. That's an idea uh, that comes from developmental psychology where we're support, it's kind of an oxymoron, we're supporting autonomy. And really that's the function of attachment in, in human relationships. We're supporting young people to explore in a way where they also feel safe. And that allows us to work towards this middle ground by approaching these conversations that are both emotionally regulated and supportive. So how do we do this? It's, it's, it's not magic. I'm gonna provide uh, an example um, in just a moment, but this is coming from the idea that emotions are the boss of the brain. Emotions are at the core of our mental health. And as I had mentioned earlier with this idea of avoidance symptoms, which we might describe as you know, behavioral outbursts in a child that uh, we're struggling with right now, or the classic example, substance use. These symptoms of mental health uh, conditions are ways of dealing with painful emotions. So when we think about the example of substance use again, people don't have substance use problems. They have substance use solutions to their emotions. And therefore, Getting at this avoidance is the key to recovery. Processing our emotions is the key to recovery. One of my favorite sayings, you have to feel it to heal it. So how do we help each other feel it? Well, I have our emojis right here right now. I use emojis a lot in therapy with kids. And you might, you might just reflect right now, how often in your family conversations do you use emotion language? You know, happy, that's a pretty safe one, but things like anxious, embarrassed, angry, frustrated, annoyed, scared, sad, disappointed, guilty, shame, like these kinds of things. The idea of doing this is that as adults, when we support children verbally through the processing of their emotions, that external regulation eventually becomes internal regulation. And over time, they become better able to regulate themselves. So there's a tip that we use that comes from a modality called emotion-focused family therapy, um, and it's called emotion coaching. And when we see, if you take one thing away from my talk today, it's this. So when one of our loved ones is experiencing distress, the first thing that we usually do as well-intentioned humans is to provide reassurance. Oh, honey, it's going to be okay. Um, or try to kind of pivot them onto something else. What we want to do to facilitate the processing of emotions is to first validate that emotion. You might say, I imagine you're feeling really sad right now, and then provide some explanation as to why it makes sense that they feel that way. That requires we take their perspective. Then we move on to provide emotional support. That might be comfort or a sense of understanding or belief in the other person, or maybe it's space. Maybe the person needs space. And then we move on to practical support, which is where we generally go first. 
And that might be proceeding with a plan, suggesting another activity, doing a redirection, offering solutions, or in the case of um, you know, difficult behavior in, in young children, it could be setting a limit as well. So here's an example of how it might look. And this is an example that I'm sure many of you have come across already um, with regard to having a child who needs to stay home from school. This is a child who likes going to school and the child needs to stay home from school because of testing COVID positive. And so we might say something like, imagine that you're feeling really sad because you have to stay home from school and because you can't see your friends for a few days and because it was right in the middle of an art project you were enjoying. And maybe you're also feeling scared because you tested positive for COVID and it's you know, a frightening thing and we don't really fully understand uh, that right now. And uh, yeah, it totally makes sense that you'd be feeling frightened in this situation. And I just want you to know that it's okay to feel this way. I'm sorry this is happening and I'm here for you. When you're ready, why don't we go downstairs and get out those art supplies and we can work on your project together while listening to the Frozen soundtrack, something like that. So this is an example of applying emotion coaching with a young child. Um, however, the same principles work with all of our relationships, uh, yeah, marital relationships, um, relationships with our adult family members, coworkers. That is, it's important that we first validate the feeling that somebody's having before we try to get them out of that place in order to convey that we understand. I kind of said this already, so I'm gonna skip over that quickly. You know, when can all this happen? Sometimes when I'm working in therapy, I hear families say, well, that's all great, but when the heck am I gonna find time to do this? And you don't have to find time to do this. There are routines and rituals that already exist in your life as a family, whether it's driving to school in the morning or driving wherever it is that you drive or over dinners, especially dinners at the holiday where these types of conversations can happen. And I mentioned that we were gonna talk about beliefs as well. So as you're reflecting on the things that I'm talking about today, you know, I ask you, what are your beliefs as a family? What are the values that you have um, that you want to instill into your children? And you know, what are, what are the attitudes that you have towards the things that are happening in this world that you want to uh, convey to, to your children and the other uh, young people in your life? And through these beliefs, we can make meaning out of adversity. We have the capacity to generate a positive outlook for the future, despite the challenging things that are happening. And related to beliefs are spirituality and, and, and religious convictions as well, which is not something that you hear um, psychologists such as myself talking about um, enough outside of kind of special topics, areas of like religion and, and psychology. And I just want to uh, leave you with a, a bit of data. We have been following a cohort of a thousand, a thousand children from 500 families throughout the course of the pandemic. And we assessed them, both children and their parents, on their coping beliefs. And so that's the family's belief to adapt when changes occur, to deal whatever comes your way, or to see the humorous side, so on and so forth. And what we found, uh, this is a lot of numbers here. All I ask you to pay attention to is the diagonal line. And that we found that caregivers who identified as more spiritual had better coping uh, later on in the pandemic and drawing for previous levels. And that predicted better mental health at a later point. So beliefs are important and they're things that we can talk about with our family as well. So to conclude, when I just mentioned how we approach these tricky topics, we begin by regulating yourself. You know, we need to find a time where it feels okay to, to bring these topics up. We're considering the age of our children, you know, very young children, we're being mindful around what we're exposing them to, but older children, um, you know, they're seeing it anyway. We're validating the emotion and then we're providing that emotional support that we get it. And from there, we move on to practical support. And in the, in the case of the conflict that's happening overseas right now, maybe it's around facts around the things that are happening or potentially even ways to help in your own community. And this works, these are data from a two day uh, workshop that uh, is hosted by colleagues of mine at the Family Psychology Center in Toronto. And uh, when families apply these principles over the course of a year, we find that children's mental health problems decrease and parents increase in their sense of self-efficacy. So with that, I wanna say thanks to all the helpers who put this talk together. 
and let's open it up for Q and A. Thank you, Dr. Brown. That was amazing. I just want Thank to give. Oh, yeah, awesome. I want to make sure. Um, you know, obviously, we want to start by thanking you for, for everything that you have uh, been able to point out today. For myself personally, I think the um, animal analogies were perfect. So thank you for making that super simple. Definitely going to throw that out to the, the rest of the family to ask if they're jellyfish versus ostrich or rhino versus kangaroo. So <laughs> definitely going to take that back. Um, I know that we're being joined by a bunch of participants. So thanks everyone again for um, you know listening, participating. Um, if there are any questions that are pressing, um, anything that's related to what Dr. Brown presented, feel welcome to throw them in the Q&A section. I'm going to get started with the two that we're seeing already. Um, so I'll throw the first one out to Dr. Brown. Um, Carolyn, thank you for submitting that question. The question is, if we bring up difficult topics frequently, would that annoy or upset our families who might not be very receptive to these difficult topics? So Dr. Brown, over to you. Yeah, you always start with an easy one, eh? Um, it's, not, it's, not an, it's not an easy question. It's not an easy question. And so from what you're saying, Carol, Carolyn or Caroline, um, it sounds like you have, oh, I lost the question. It sounds like you have um, family members who are less amenable to those types of conversations and you wanna bring things up and they might get irritated because that's not their kind of, their modus operandi. That's not the way that they kind of generally do things. Um, yeah, so I have two suggestions there. One is to time your approach. That is, if there is a time where it might be safer to connect or that the person seems more relaxed, so like maybe not when somebody's walking through the door at the end of the day, uh, maybe on the weekend, or if you're having a slow morning on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, that's that's one idea. And you know, certainly, I, I find that myself when when uh, my family wants to bring stuff up and I'm just like totally exhausted at the end of the day or something like that. That can be that can be a little more challenging. Um, or maybe you know, if if you're alone with this person um, in the car or something like that, that could be uh, a time where you get people and they can't escape. From you. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding a little bit, but not really. Um, the other is the idea of bringing up what you're saying as the thing that you're bringing up. So you might say something along the lines of, you know, so-and-so, I, I notice that every time I bring, uh, or most of the times when I bring something up, um, you seem to get kind of uncomfortable and you don't really want to talk about it. And then rather going um, in an accusatory way, validate the person like, you know, that, that makes sense because I'm bringing up things that, I'm bringing up things that people generally don't want to talk about. I'm not sure what the example is in your situation, um, Carolyn, but you might say something to that perspective and first validate. It's like, yeah, I, I get it that, you know, you don't really want to talk about um, these things because they're uncomfortable, because they're awkward. Um, and I just want you to know that I'm here to talk about those things. And also it would be important um, for me to hear from you on those things as well. So when you're ready, I'm here. And then you can kind of go from there or something like that. So you're, you're validating, you're kind of um, not being dismissive of the person's, you know, maybe, maybe the person is getting really uncomfortable when, um, when this sort of thing is coming up. Um, so you're validating that perspective. And then you're also conveying your needs because you're allowed to have needs as well. Um, so in the, in the case that this is like a romantic partner and um, you're not really able to get into those um, more vulnerable, meaningful conversations, you know, after validating the person's perspective, and so you've diffused the bomb, um, then you can say what you need as well and you're allowed to have those needs. 
That's great. I love that. So assess the timing and then make sure you're validating their concerns. So that's, that's awesome. Thank you. Yes. Um, we do have two other questions that I'm seeing come up. Um, one more specific. So give me a little bit to read that out loud. Um, what if, if you have a precocious young child around the age of five, eager for information, more than their twin or even older siblings? Should you be indulging this child more in their questions despite their young age? For example, their curiosity can lead to listening in or on distressing adult conversations. news. Um, the question specifically is, how do you weigh what is developmentally appropriate when it comes to um, children that are developmentally unique? Yeah, and isn't that fascinating? I'd be interested to know if they're um, identical twins as well. Um, it, the, it's, it's amazing how different children um, can be, children from the same family can be from one another. Um, and yeah, I, I think you've kind of almost, like the, I think the answer to your, your question is, is, in, is in the question. It's like, how do you weigh what is developmentally appropriate? And I think that is that it's, it's kind of something that you, that you have to wrestle with. So say that this young person is really interested in, the war in the Ukraine, for example, because children from birth are exposed to all sorts of media. So it's not uncommon, especially for a bright five-year-old to be privy to the events of the world. Um, and then, you know, you might, you might uh, set up a conversation and say, well, maybe that's, you know, uh, well, actually, let me go back. First, we're validating. So, you know, it makes sense that you want to know what's going on in the world because it's a big deal and everybody seems to be talking about it. And, the other day you heard me talking about it with so-and-so and, and now you're curious. So, so I totally get it. And then what I might do is um, perhaps have some curated content that you've already reviewed to expose the uh, child to on the topic. So I had mentioned TikTok in the, in the story that I was, um, or in the in the in the um, example family that I was doing at the beginning, and yeah, when you're scrolling through TikTok and looking at stuff like the Ukraine or even with with COVID, you know, you can come across bodies and really graphic stuff. And I have absolutely seen numerous children who have nightmares associated with distressing images that they've seen. You know, these are children who are kind of prone to anxiety in the first place, but then they're having really distressing um, nightmares and anxiety around things that they've seen online. So perhaps there's a way where you could, um, depending on whatever it is that the, I'm not sure what, what, what the child's interested in learning more, but maybe it's everything. Um, and then perhaps you could even find some news sources. I would maybe go to like CBC, like that's usually pretty, um, trigger warning, safe kind of stuff, and then just maybe skim through, or maybe it's you being the, um, maybe it's you being the source of information and, and you're saying that you can, you can talk about it. So again, if it's, if it's the war in Ukraine, um, you can uh, get out a map or an atlas if, if you still have those in your house or go on Google Maps, probably more likely. Um, and look up where the Ukraine is, and then you can show where people are going, and you can show how far the people have come. So I hope that I hope that answers your question a little bit. I think um, I think that you you do want to be mindful and, and not uh, yet at the age of five give uh, children the free reign of the internet because you know there is a lot of stuff out there. No, that's great. And, and definitely, I mean, the, the balancing act, like you mentioned, right, is you want to make sure you're not raising them in a bubble, but you also want to expose them to a certain level of curated content. That actually ties really well into another question that's come up, Dr. Brown, is um, how do you suggest interrupting or inoculating against misinformation, especially when it comes from unmonitored sources like TikTok, the one you mentioned in your sort of example? Yeah. So before I answer that question, two resources that I think are great for all families, especially families concerned with this issue or just media in general, um, Media Smarts, which is Canadian, and Common Sense Media, which is in the United States. 
And these are nonprofit organizations dedicated to the healthy relationship between children and media. Thanks for putting those in there. And so there'll be way more resources and suggestions than I can get to today. Um, and yeah, depending on the age of the teen so the, or the child. So, I, so in the previous question, we had a five-year-old. So now we're at, at the age of five, we have parents who are really much more controlling um, the media habits and, and diets of, of their children. Once you're, uh, once, once you're working with teens and, and they have their own um, privacy when it comes to browsing and uh, apps and stuff, I think it really uh, makes sense to open this up as a conversation. Um, saying, you know, I was thinking about um, misinformation on the media. Maybe you came across something the other, the other day on, on the media and you can say to the young person in your life, uh, yeah, and I, you know, found this totally bogus article online and it was like saying stuff that I knew wasn't true. Does that ever happen to you um, when you're on, on TikTok uh, particularly or Instagram or coming across articles, uh, whatever? There is research showing that uh, the digital natives, that is kids who were born with the internet um, and are more savvy than we are uh, when it comes to this stuff. So, so, you, so you might be, uh, you know, in, there's always exceptions and it's hard to speak to the individual from a general trend. Um, but I, I, think, I think it really makes sense talking about misinformation um, in, in your family. And that can be part of this broader idea of uh, having a family media plan, how you want mm. media to interface with your family life. There's lots of stuff on those two websites around family media plans. And another book um, that I recommend, again, I have no financial uh, <laughs> involvement in any of these, um, is it? Oh, sorry, okay, Mary's asking a follow-up question. Um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Yes, uh, The Art of Screen Time by Anya Kamenz, K-A-M-E-N-T-Z. Um, that's if, if you're interested in the children and screens, children and media, children and internet debate, I, I highly recommend that book. And Mary's asking, is it important to ask the child what they want to know? I would, I would say so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no need to, there's no need to have a crystal ball here. Um, in fact, I think mind reading is one thing that we tell people not to do in family therapy. Um, and we want to hear the multitude of perspectives that people have in, in families and, and not only what they want to know, but how they perceive the world. That's totally fair. Yeah. I mean, imagine guessing what's going on in your five-year-old's mind. I, I don't think we can do that effectively yet. As yeah. parents or even caregiver, that's definitely not happening. Thank you. Um, and thanks everyone for uh, submitting your questions. I believe we probably only have one, time for one more, right, Jennifer? I, I see you other. Thank you. Um, so the last one we can uh, tackle is how do you deal with an eight-year-old kid when their friends have different perspectives about an issue or a topic? And as a parent, you may want to explain that differently. And I, I think that's that's an interesting one for sure. Yeah, you know that's that's a that's a great question. Thank you to whoever said that. Um, I did a, a media spot recently since kids have been getting vaccinated, and how to talk to your kids if your kid is vaccinated and the other kids aren't, or if your kid's not vaccinated and the other kids are, and it's not easy. First of all. But I, I, I do have maybe an idea around how you can um, speak to that. And I would suggest saying something along the lines of, um, you know, first of all, validating, and I always been validating, you know, it, it makes sense that you're, you know, confused as to why um, you might be vaccinated and so and so down the street isn't, or vice versa. And um, I just want you to know that everything, whether you're speaking as an individual parent or as a co-parent, everything that we do as parents uh, is to keep you safe. Not everybody agrees right now on what the best way to keep their kids safe is. And it's kind of like different families having different rules. So you might know 
uh, of kids who are able to play video games um, after dinner. And in our house, we're not allowed to do that. So just because people have different rules doesn't mean they love their children any more or less. We're all trying to make sense of what's a confusing situation. Um, and then you also might provide some reassurance saying, no matter what the case, and you know, this is, this is a bit of a delicate one because I know there's some scary data out there. Um, whatever the case is, most children who get COVID do not get very sick. Um, now, of course, there is the whole long COVID conversation and I am not advocating lying about anything. I think it is true that most children who, who get COVID do not um, get sick. So yeah, that's, that's the, and, and I guess just to take a step back from that, it's the idea that you're validating whatever emotion that you're seeing your young person bring to you in this situation. Um, and then you're providing the emotional support and saying, whatever it is that we do, we're doing it to keep you safe and because we love you. Um, some families might have different ways of doing that and just the same way some families have different uh, religions and some families do different things over the summer holiday and some families have different rules and um, that's why you know things might be a little bit different for for different um, families right now however um, you know we love you so and so's family loves them and we're just um, doing our our best right now then I would try to do a distraction and, and get on to something else <laughs> and avoid that conversation no I'm kidding yeah no, that's been super helpful. Thank you so much. And thanks again, everyone, for your questions. Over to you, Jennifer. Well, I just have to say thank you so much, Dr. Brown. And thank you to all of our friends and colleagues at OISE. It has been a real treat um, to help co-host this session and um, such fantastic learnings. I love the information on how to combat um, misinformation because that is truly a struggle for lots of families as well as how to deal with, have those difficult conversations. So thank you again, Dr. Brown. We really, really appreciate your time. And thank you again to our colleagues at OISE and the Office of Advancement and External Relations for helping to organize this event with us. And we were just so delighted to partner with you. And thank you to all of our attendees today. We really appreciate your time and hope you enjoyed the session. So enjoy your evening and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye everyone.